and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This podcast is sponsored by Syncback Pro, the professional photographer's tool to keep your images safe. How safe are your photographs? Or to put it this way, how would you feel if you permanently lost some or even all of them? The fact is, there are very real risks in storing your digital images on a hard drive, even if they're backed up to an external device. There's ransomware, hardware failure, file corruption, virus infection, and even accidental deletion or destruction. Syncback Pro makes this problem go away permanently. Syncback Pro is the professional photographer's tool to back up photographs, images, documents, and data files. Once set up, it keeps your files safe, quietly and reliably in the background. So if problems occur or disaster strikes, you'll have nothing to worry about. Your photographs will be safe. Which is why it's also the backup solution that I use myself for my own photographs. Take advantage of an exclusive 25% discount today by going to www.backup.sg. The software will never expire, meaning your photographs are safe forever. That's www.backup.sg. Give your photographs the protection they deserve. And now, on with the show. Adam Gibbs is a remarkable landscape photographer, showcasing the beauty and grandeur of the natural world through his captivating images. With a deep reverence for the wilderness, he ventures into remote and breathtaking locations to capture moments of awe-inspiring beauty. Adam's photos transport viewers to untamed landscapes where they can witness the power and serenity of nature firsthand. His skillful compositions blend light, form and colour to create visually stunning and evocative images that leave a lasting impression. Beyond his artistic prowess, Adam is a generous educator, sharing his knowledge and expertise through workshops and his YouTube channel. He inspires others to explore their own creative potential in the realm of landscape photography, leaving an enduring impact on aspiring photographers. We discuss how he not only captures the essence of the landscapes he encounters, but also instills a deep appreciation for the natural world, how he got started with YouTube, and what he sees as the future of landscape photography, along with loads more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Adam. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? It's going great. Thank you very much for asking. Fantastic having you on the show too. Been a fan of your YouTube videos for some time and your photography. And I'm really pleased that you agreed to say yes to coming on the show. I guess one of the things that I'm really interested in talking to people about is why they do what they do. Can you talk a little bit about why you do YouTube, but also why you do landscape photography, because I, which came first? Was it the photography or the desire to share the experience? How much time have we got? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of time. <laughs> Let's see now. I So I've been a photographer, a professional photographer for over 30 years now. And Originally, I, I taught uh, rock climbing. I was very heavily into rock climbing and mountaineering. Sure. And that was back in the 80s. And uh, it came, up, came to a point where I was just spending way too much time climbing and I wasn't making much money. I'd just work odd jobs. So I decided at that time, my girlfriend, friend who I married, she suggested that I maybe look into getting into photography. I'd already has a, always had a bit of a, an interest in it, but not, I wasn't hugely into it. Sure. And the catalyst from that for that was actually, she had a, she she had taken a workshop, a photography workshop with a photographer named John Shaw, who's an American photographer. Yep. This was back in the eighties and she had his book and I just happened to be glancing through it. And I, I was just blown away by the quality of his photographs. Mm. So I started to try and do the copy and of course I failed dismally. So anyway, I decided to go back to school and I went back, to, I went to uh, college for a couple of years and I took a photography program there with the intent of working in a studio. Okay. And I did a bit of, a, I worked in a studio for about two weeks and I said, to hell with that. There's no way I'm working in a studio <laughs> because 
the guys I was working with, all they did was complain about how much money they weren't making and complaining about clients. And I thought this isn't really for me. Yeah. So the nature photography was stemmed out of my enjoyment of rock climbing. It came from that end of things because mm. I'd always liked camping and stuff. And at that time, I didn't have an awful lot of money to travel or for photo gear or anything like that. So I would spend most of my time while I was going to school photographing in public gardens around Vancouver. Yep. And because that was the closest I could get to nature. And from photographing in those gardens, I gradually had a bit of a what I thought at that time was a great body of work of gardens, which it really wasn't, but I thought I was good. And so I started sending out my portfolio to gardening magazines in yeah. around North, North America. And there was one magazine in Vancouver that picked me up and they started using my stuff. And after I'd finished college, they used my stuff more and more. And it got to the point where I was working for them pretty much full time. Basically, what I was doing was they would give me a list of all the writers and I'd get in touch with the writers and they would give me a list of the gardens that they were going to write about. And then I would fly or travel around British Columbia to start with yeah, yeah. photographing gardens. And at that time, magazines were doing really well. Gardens West started to expand right across Canada. So then they had four, four magazines. So then it wasn't just British Columbia. It was right across Canada. So every year I, I would fly across Canada photographing gardens mm. and that that lasted for 20 20 years or so oh, yeah. and then about six years ago the owner of the magazine Dorothy Horton she was an elderly lady she retired and she gave this the magazine to her son who was a lawyer from Victoria which is on the island here yeah and yeah. he basically he had no interest in running a magazine and of course, magazines, as most magazines have gone pretty much tits up. Yeah, it's hard um, to find them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Gardens West or Cornwall Publishing or Gardens West, as it was called, just couldn't keep up with the transition over to digital. All magazines were doing online magazines and YouTube yep. videos. And she, they just couldn't wrap their head around it. So the magazine went bankrupt. And uh, I was just left in the lurch because that, that was pretty much my, all of my income just went down the drain. So I decided to run, start running workshops like every other photographer out there. Yeah. And it was a dismal failure. I just couldn't get clients because I did a lot of nature photography kind of as a sideline. It was more of a hobby. Yeah, yeah. And I knew a lot of other photographers, but those aren't the people that you're selling your workshops to you want you'll be selling them to the general public it's kind, it. of like print. Yeah. it's kind of like prints right yeah so we always want to sell prints if you just know other photographers they're not going to buy your prints right <laughs> so it was a dismal failure and i lost a lot of money because i couldn't get clients so that's when i decided to start up a youtube channel and okay. of course in retrospect i wish i'd started it like 10 years earlier because yeah, it's yeah. just been it's a it's been a boon for me it's really brought in a lot of business not just from workshops but all kinds of other things that I wasn't really even thinking of yeah and of course I lucked out because I I had a friend that lived on the island here Gavin Hardcastle who some of your viewers probably know photo tripper mm -hmm. so I teamed up with him we did a bunch of videos together and then I managed to team up with Nick Page, another yep. photographer, and of course, Thomas Heaton, which everybody knows. Yeah. So that really helped bring more people to my channel. And uh, to, to be honest with you, the, the YouTube is a funny thing. It's uh, when I was a photographer selling rights to images, y you were always in competition with every other photographer and you held everything here, right? You didn't want to give yeah. up too much information because jobs are hard to get right yeah but with youtube it seems that it's it's the total opposite if the more you collaborate with other people and the more you do stuff with them that draws more viewers to your channel yeah. the, the more you share the the better precisely the yeah. yeah yeah and for anybody that's thinking of getting into photography as a, as a living i would highly recommend considering starting up a youtube channel even if it's yeah. a small channel you don't need a huge audience you just need 
a regular people amount of people to keep watching your channel yeah that's the, there's that saying about a thousand true fans is what you need to be able to sustain yeah it's true of course there's photographers out there that have hundreds of thousands of subscribers but that doesn't always translate into views no and what i'm finding is that like you said if you have a bunch of people that are regular viewers that are big fans of yours then you can often just make enough money to keep going for yeah. those people so that's in a in a nutshell that's how i got into youtube it was and I mean, it's difficult because youtube standing in front of a camera talking to a camera is not doesn't come naturally to me or a lot of other people it takes yeah. a while yeah. to because you just feel like an idiot you're standing there and, and you think you're very self-conscious, right? People looking at you and they're probably thinking, what a twop. What's he doing? <laughs> looking at himself talking to a camera? <laughs> yeah. But it's it's fun. I enjoy, I enjoy it. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. Do you ever go out and just take photos or is it all about building the content for the channel? No, that's... It's, a, it's funny you should mention that because that's been a huge problem for me mm. in that when I first started YouTube... I thought I'm going to get all these neat cameras and I'm going, to, I'm going to do time lapse and I'm going to do drone footage and I'm going to do this and that. But what I find is that stuff, it takes so much time because yeah. you're a one man show, right? Yeah. It takes yeah. so much time that your photography ends up suffering because it's a whole, it's a whole different genre, video and then photography. Yeah. You might be using the same cameras, but y you have to think differently. Yeah. And what I was finding was that, I was spending way too much time on the video and not enough time on my photography. And at the end of the day, it's really the photography that I really enjoy, not so much the video. Yeah. So I've, and people have noticed this in the last year or so, I've really backed off on the video to the point where sometimes it's the videos somewhat, they suffer somewhat because it looks like I'm being lazy, but I just want to spend more time with the photography. Yeah. Rather than the video. I, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why most of my videos are about composition and light mm. is because that's, it's just me out in the field, just taking images, but I'm talking out loud about what I'm trying, what I'm looking at in the field. Some people find it really dull, which is fine. And some people, it really helps them along. I've certainly found that I've helped my photography in a lot of ways, particularly that where you're looking at those intimate details of some of some of the subjects as opposed to the grand vistas that a lot of people enjoy and tend to be more impactful. And certainly for me anyway, I know they get greater impact and greater engagement, but looking at those smaller details just fascinates me. And part of that has been inspired by some of your work. Great. Yeah, I think, I think most people understand that when you're out in the field and you're trying to talk about photography, then the photography comes first. Yeah. Or you could approach it as you know, Tom is quite a bit different. Tom Heaton, where he's actually trying to tell a story. So it's yeah. not even though it's about photography, it's more about the journey of him, whether he be camping in his van or cooking in his van or whatever. People enjoy that aspect, whereas I just cut through all that stuff and just go straight to the photography because that's the bit that I'm interested in. Yeah. Because you you have to keep it interesting for yourself, otherwise you're just going to get bored of it and you know it's just not yeah. going to work. I was going to ask, how do you keep it interesting? How do you keep your own engagement up and try to find new um, different ways of doing it? It goes it goes up and down, obviously. Like yeah. I I'm lucky because I I live on Vancouver. Island. We have a pretty good base for things to photograph. Yep. But of course, in the winter, it's like anywhere in the winter, it's the weather's not that great and subject matter is dull looking. There are times when I wish I was somewhere else. But I, what I try to do is lately, I've been doing quite a bit of traveling. So that's really helped if I could go just go to a different location just to get the cobwebs brushed away. So you get inspired to, to keep going because what I find is if you just keep going to the same areas over and over again, even though your photography might improve, it gets a bit dull after a while, even if it's yeah. a spectacular area. It sounds awful, but if you're going to the same waterfall over and over again, it's it, it gets hard to get inspired. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's un understandable. I guess I'm interested also in where 
the artistic side of things started for you? What was it that changed from in, in your own photography where you were doing landscapes, I guess, as a hobby, doing the gardens uh, as a job? Whereabouts in that sort of time? line did you start to say okay this is actually more about art than it is just recording what I'm seeing I don't know like I said I've always had an interest in nature photography but when I first started in the 90s there there weren't that many photographers making a living out of nature photography it was a pretty small market and of course when you're just selling photographs or the rights to photographs there was a very small market for those. And even today, there isn't a huge market for yeah, You're lucky lands. if you didn't make any money for landscape. <laughs> selling prints is one thing. Yeah. I mean, you have to be selling prints all the time and marketing yourself all the time to, to make a living out of selling prints. Yeah, And I used to sell a lot of images to calendars, but calendars... You can't make a living out of selling images to calendars. Yeah. Yeah. I think in the last... Since I've been doing it, Every calendar that I, I sent to send images to, they haven't put their rates up in 20 odd years. Wow. You sell them an image or the rights to an image, and most of them are giving you like 150 bucks. Yeah. You, you do the math, how many images you're going to have to sell. To- <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a cheap night out here in Sydney, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but the, so when I first started, so when I was doing the garden photography, most of my nature photography was done with a four by five film camera. Yep, yep. So that I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And at that time, most of the I say serious landscape photographers were all using larger format cameras. And I wanted to be one of those guys out there with my four by five. Yeah, yeah. And so then when I started the YouTube channel, I already had a pretty good portfolio of images from the last 20 odd years to to fall back on so I figured I've been doing it for a long time I must have something to say to people that could be helpful and you know people had said that they really liked my images other than just my mum and dad so I figured they they must be half decent if it's not just my mum and dad saying they're decent (laughs) (laughs) or your wife or whatever so I yeah I don't know I don't know when the I don't know that's a hard one to answer to be honest Okay. Okay. I guess I'm interested also in the role that personal expression plays and how you have developed your style from where you started to where you are now. Your style comes across as being very naturalistic, as in it's a pretty fair representation of what that, that said, you're finding unique ways of expressing that landscape in your images. And I'm, I guess I'm just interested in how that style has developed in terms of your personal preferences in both composition and editing. I'm not, my, I don't think my photography is groundbreaking, that's for sure. I'm very literal. I don't, now and then I'll do the odd abstract, but I really yeah. do like the natural landscape. And one of my motivations for that has been especially now, and even when Photoshop first started up, the tendency was to just overcook images. And even when you look on a lot of images online, they're just so over the top, dramatic. And a lot of people went that way because they wanted to get attention for their photographs. That seems that the more epic that it is, the more attention you'll get for your photographs, which is unfortunate. And I think in some ways, photography has suffered a little bit in that realm because people fluff it off and say it's art i can do anything i want that that is true yeah. but at the same time i don't think you're really doing the natural world any favors by making it look more dramatic than it really is because it, it really is dramatic on its own it doesn't need um fluffing up and especially now with ai i don't know where that's going to go i don't think it will harm photography but it's certainly turned it into kind of a, a lot of the AI stuff reminds me of those those posters you used to see at like dollar stores and that where you'd see yeah, these just, another one you mean yeah I mean it's just it just looks so garish and just so over the top that yeah. but if you like that stuff that's great but the reason why I try to be true to it is that from a conservation side of things I, I think as time goes on more and more people are getting so detached from the natural world that yeah. 
it doesn't matter what you show them, they'll just say that's real. When you have these absolutely horrible, garish images that just are so far from the truth that it, it doesn't do nature any favors, yeah. if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I, I try to portray it in a way that is somewhat natural, even though I obviously use Photoshop and I manipulate things and I'll clone things out if they don't fit. I don't stretch it peaks or change skies or anything like that. But obviously I am manipulating images to a certain degree, but I try to make them at least look somewhat what the real scene <laughs> looks like, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll get you. But that's just the style of photography I like. I just keep plodding along and just taking things that really move me and photographing the subjects that, that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big thing in photography your best photographs are going to be definitely of objects or subjects that you really enjoy looking at and uh, and spending yeah. time with. I just keep plodding along and keep photographing whatever, whatever moves me. <laughs> Obviously enough people like them. Yeah. And my It's funny, in my YouTube videos, when I uh, very early on, I decided that I was going to put my raw files up with my finished okay. files. Yeah. I don't know why I did that. I guess I just wanted to give people an idea of how far or how little I'd actually done. Yeah, how much pushing um, you'd done in the edit. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things that people have to realize is that when it comes to photography, the, the thing that I really do enjoy is the, the process of making a photograph. Yeah. Hiking to an area, setting up, trying to figure out complex compositions. Sometimes it might be simple. Sometimes it might be complex, but that's the part that I really enjoy. Yeah. And I, I always try to explain to people what I, I try to do as much in camera as possible. So I don't have to do all this stuff in Photoshop when I get yeah. back. Yeah. And usually most of my processing, all it involves is some contrast control and perhaps a little dodging and burning. And that's about it. Because yeah. if you, I figure if you have good composition, good light, then you're well on your way to a decent image. What you shouldn't have to do much when you get home. Absolutely, absolutely. That naturalistic style is that's obviously fed into other projects like the Natural Landscape Photography Awards. Where did that sort of genesis of the awards and everything come from? I'm not. I'm not one of the founders of that, but I was one. Of, I guess I was one of the judges for the first com contest. Yep. <clears throat> And I have to be careful what I say here because uh, I guess it was back in 2018, there's a, a massive contest called the International Landscape Photographer of the Year Awards. Yep. And I was the grand, I was the grand, the first, one year I came second and then and the year after I, I was first, which was a huge surprise to me because most of the images that I see that are winners in, in that contest tend to be heavily processed. Yeah. But the yeah. funny thing is that the year that I won, there were a couple of images that I put in that I did do quite a bit of processing on. And I think the reason why those guys started up the Natural Landscape Photography Awards is that I think they're just trying to get people back to the basics of photography rather than digital art, because yeah. there seems to be a fine line between digital art and photography. Absolutely. And I think they started up because they wanted to see what people could come up with just from the skill of going out in the field and, and taking photographs rather than producing them after the fact. Let's face it, you can now you can you could take a really mediocre image and then bring it back into your computer and you could turn it into something that's just spectacular by just Absolutely, yeah. adding all kinds of things. So I think they just wanted to get back to the basics and I think it's been pretty popular. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. And they're not and they're not saying you can't manipulate at all and you can't use Photoshop. That's not it at all. They just yeah. want submissions that are true to the art of photography and i don't have a problem with that at all hey it was funny because one year i was actually thinking of i think someone did it already but now that ai is around i thought wouldn't it be great if someone just took a totally ai image and entered it and won and see where that like in one of these other contests you know because that's gonna happen at, at some point you think there, where's this there was one the that? other day the some sony awards international awards that sony were doing they had a they picked a winner that was totally ai created so they obviously weren't looking at raw files or anything around which, which is a, a surprise because that doesn't really exactly it doesn't sell cameras does it <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> might sell computers but... 
Does Sony make computer? I guess they do. I don't know. I don't, uh, well, they, I'm pretty sure they make the chips and things for some of them. But yeah, yeah, that 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 was, I think, one one of the one of the issues that I want to talk about a little bit later is that future of photography and and some of the challenges around things like AI. Before we get to that, though, I'm interested, I guess, in some of the things you talked about in terms of the conservation of the natural landscape and so forth. How do you go about making sure that whilst you're maybe promoting a location or whatever in either a video or in some of your images, that's also not necessarily getting oversaturated with people wanting to come and visit it? Yeah, it's a hard one. I guess I'm somewhat lucky because living on the island here and actually in British Columbia, there aren't a huge amount of outdoor photographers. Yeah. There, there are a lot of photographers, but most of them are into portraiture and products and stuff like that. Yeah. I do get people asking where locations are. It, depend, it depends where it is. And if it's common knowledge, then sometimes I'll say, yeah, sure, it's this place. But if it's not common knowledge then I'll just refrain and just say, I'm sorry, but part of the enjoyment of photography is actually discovering these places for yourself. And yeah, yeah. a lot of the places that I go to, they weren't, someone didn't tell me where they were. They were because there were areas that I had to find for myself. Yep. And really, it's not that hard to do. No. Just a, sim- a simple Google search and you can pretty much find anything. Pretty much. <laughs> Even if you're looking for a specific location of a photograph where someone's gone before, yeah, that yeah. it's pretty easy to find out where those things are. Yeah. And I think to myself, that's what I usually just say to them. I just say, just do a simple Google search. and I'm sure you'll find it. Yeah, yeah. But I do know that some areas have really been trashed from photographers trying to get the same shot as everybody else, which I don't know. I, I understand why people do it, but the part that I, I do have a hard time with is that they're not really thinking about their impact on the area that they're photographing. Yeah. When you care more about the photograph than the area that you're in, then there's something wrong there. Definitely. And yeah. there's been areas that I've been to, they're just absolutely trashed, mostly vegetation from photographers just stomping around trying to get a composition. And they're not really thinking about how they're impacting that, that area. Cause some of these areas are very small. Mm. and quite fragile yeah i the thing is there are so many areas to photograph throughout the world that i figure there's there's tons of people going to the area i don't need to go to the area i'll just go and find another area there's there's just endless (laughs) amounts of places i was like you don't always have to go to the honeypot places precisely if a lot of people come to the canadian rockies and the first thing they do is they run they go up to moraine lake which is just absolutely packed with photographers don't get me wrong it's an incredible scene but there's some awesome scenes not far from here you just have to hike a little ways and you won't see anybody that's it yeah yeah The flip side of that is using photography as a tool to educate people about promoting conservation and so forth. What are you? What are your thoughts around that? No, I think it's a brilliant idea. I, I in some ways, I, I wish I, I was doing a little bit more than what I am doing. The only thing that I've really done in the in the past couple of years is concentrate a bit more on the old growth forest on Vancouver Island here. And for a while there, I was doing a number of videos trying to at least make people aware of what's going on in Canada. Yeah, I guess the thing that really bugged me was that a lot of Canadians would be complaining about what they're doing in the rainforest in Brazil or wherever, but the exact same thing is going on in our own backyard and nobody yeah. seems to flip an eye for it. And it's really disturbing that these things happen but it it doesn't matter who you talk to or where they're from the same thing is going on around the world with rainforests and old growth forest and even australia i know you guys have some old growth forests and they're they're still cutting down old growth forest in australia unfortunately yeah yeah and at the end of the day we all know what it's all about but i guess as a photographer at least you can try and make people aware of it but the problem is that my photography, when I take photographs of those areas, it's I'm showing it to people that already have somewhat of a 
they care about the environment because they're nature photographers right so they yeah. must care yeah. about it somewhat <laughs> so it <laughs> I, you know I, I guess my audience is not really the right audience it's kind of like trying to like i said about the prints trying to sell prints to other photographers yeah yeah I'd like to do, I'd like to try and do a bit more. I try to, with my photography, now and then I'll try and raise a bit of money and donate it to some of the, the organizations that try to promote old growth forest. Actually, was it two days ago? I did a talk for a group of people through Nick Stover, photographer in the States. Yep. And part of the money from that goes towards whatever charity you want. I don- donated 500 bucks towards the Ancient Forest Alliance. It's not much, but at least it, it's going to a reasonably good cause. Yeah. I, to be honest, I think anything that anyone can give to that sort of organisation is worth it. Yeah, yeah. Even locally here, my my partner, she's actually she's out right now measuring trees. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of development going on. And, of course, they're just mowing down everything and concreting everything. And her yeah. big beef is because we're on wells here and we get our water from wells and the yeah. aquifer. If you keep concreting everything, where's the water going to go? Where's the water from? going? Yeah, that's it. Stuff like that. But I think the problem is that, like I said earlier, what it is is that a lot of people aren't necessarily doing it out of spite or for greed. They just don't know about it. They don't think about it. They don't think yeah. about where does my water come from or what happens when we cut these trees down? Because it's not just about cutting trees down. It's a whole... It's a whole ecosystem, you know. Absolutely, these, yeah. There's these, the these animals, tree. the fungi that uh, precisely, yeah. and the ocean and everything. It's a ho- it's a whole circle of life. It's not just about big old trees. Oh, That's the cool. part that people don't seem to get. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested in the travel side of your photography. What's the furthest you've travelled to to get a shot? <laughs> Probably. I was just in I was in Africa recently, so yeah. that was a pretty long trip. Yeah. I have been I've been to Antarctica. I've been twice now. So that's pretty far. It's a long trip. Have you got um, a favorite place from around the world? Oh geez. Other than BC. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like every time you go away somewhere, all of a sudden that's your favorite place and you want to yeah, go back. Yeah. It's a bit of a problem because traveling it goes against what I was just saying about conservation. You, yeah, if you're yeah. traveling, if you're traveling everywhere, then you know you're not doing anybody any favors by jumping on a jet. Every, I do try to limit it somewhat, and I figure, well, it's only been the last several years that I've actually started being able, being able to travel more because I have a bit more money. But I think, I mean, our trip to Africa was just incredible. We ended yeah. up going to the Drakensberg. Well, there's a photographer named Alex Nail. I don't know if you know him. I've, I've seen his work and watched, watched a few of his videos on YouTube as well. I actually was looking at his Drakensberg video yesterday. And yeah. Uh, no, noticed you in the background of a few shots. Yeah. It was an absolutely incredible location. I And the reason why I went there is because I'd seen some videos of Alex's in the past. So I mm. contacted him and said, I'd really love to come on one of your trips just as a client. I, we paid to go. Sure. And he ran a, an awesome trip. The porters were excellent with the guides. Everything about the whole trip was really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. So much so that we're going to go back again next year with him. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Because it, and Alex is a great guy. He's great to hang out with. And the Drakensberg is an area that it takes some effort to get up there. So not, it's not going to, you're not going to get tons of photographers up there. Yeah. And the, the scenery and the landscape is just incredible. Just unbelievable. And then same with, because we went down to the Drakensberg, it was a nine day trip and we figured that's a hell of a long way to go just for nine days. So we extended it and ended up going to Namibia for several days beforehand. And I'd never really thought about going to Namibia. I've seen lots of images from there, but I thought if I go there, I'm just going to end up taking the same shots as everybody else. But again, it was just an incredible location. I'd go back in a heartbeat. It's it the landscape is just so cool yeah yeah and I'd, love, I'd, I'd love to come to australia i've never been to australia you've never been okay oh come you know, my my mum and dad have lived in australia <laughs> but i've never been <laughs> actually my older brother he was born in perth okay <laughs> yeah but i've never been <laughs> uh, well it's it's got its own unique 
landscapes. It's like everywhere else. I think I've been to Canada and uh, never been to Africa yet. So that, that's still on the list. But if you, if you do get out here, hit me up and All right. we'll <laughs> and have a beer or a coffee. <laughs> That's the thing. If I go to Australia, if I went, if I came over to Australia, it would have to be for a while because it's you just yeah, can't, you can't do it in two weeks. Yeah. You can't. People tend to underestimate the distances. Well, it's massive. Yeah. Australia is a massive country. Yeah, it's not that Canada's small either. Canada, yeah, but Canada, you got the West Coast, and then you've got the Rockies, and then it, all in between, there is some nice stuff, but. It's pretty flat and pretty flat. Yeah, well, there's pl- plenty of flatness out here. Too. <laughs> That's true. It's mostly farming and yeah. and north. The north is some amazing stuff in, up in the north. But even the province that I live in, if I want to drive from here to the Yukon, it takes two days just to get to yeah, the border right. of the Yukon. It's a big, it's a big country. If I want to go and visit my brother, he lives on the east coast. It takes six days to drive. Six days there. to drive across. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long way, Absolutely. and it's a, it's a horrible drive. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be heading over to visit Gavin over in Newfoundland. <laughs> That's a funny thing. So we had organized, I think Gavin's probably mad at me because we had organized, we were going to do a, a project together. But then when I priced it out and for me to fly to Nova Scotia or Newfoundland, it costs more to fly there than it does to Africa. Yeah. <laughs> which is just insane. And when I think about it, I'd rather go to Africa than Nova Scotia. Yeah. I, I got to admit, it's not much different here in Australia. If you want to fly to somewhere like Cairns up in the far north Queensland, that's more expensive than going to New Zealand or Bali. And if I was oh. going to go somewhere, I'd probably pick Bali or New Zealand over, over Cairns. Let's just say somewhere that's quite a bit different than where you already are. That's it, um, yeah. And it did take me, I have driven Cairns to Sydney in, I think it was about 33 hours. That was pretty much nonstop. That was a ridiculous drive for certain reasons that I'm not going to go into. <laughs> but yeah, yeah 33 brutal. hours that's... in a car is not fun. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. And it's hot, right? Up north, yeah, it's it's tropical. So even now it's autumn here and going into winter, the nights can get cool. But when I say cool, they're still 16, 17 degrees. You yeah. Know, but, and so daytime temperatures, they're very rare that your top is below 32. Yeah, that's pretty warm. Yeah, yeah, very tropical. Very nice for other reasons than, uh, yeah. you know, some of those places. But uh, I guess I'm in- also interested in what's been your most memorable photography experience. What's the one that really sticks out to you? Oh, man. Wow, you're really asking the hard questions now. <laughs> it's funny. I'm right in the middle of, I'm putting together another book. And this one's going to be a bit different than my first one. The first one was more of a portfolio, but this one I'm actually putting in descriptions of some of my f- favorite images. and. I, I there are a lot of areas that I've I really enjoyed and had some good memories of but one one area that sticks in my mind constantly is it's called the enchantments it's in Washington state yep it's in the north cascades there and I've been lucky enough to go up there three times I I haven't been there probably in about 10 years the last trip I went on was with a photographer named Sean Bagshaw yep and David Cobb and David and Sean and I went hiked up there. It's brutal getting up there. It's it's about twenty kilometers and fifteen hundred meters of elevation. Yeah, wow! So it's brutal, but it's absolutely stunning up there. And in the fall, there's alpine larch that turn golden yellow, and then there's all these alpine tarns up there. So it really mm. is a photographer's paradise. Uh, unfortunately. Even back then, you had to get your. It's on a lottery system, so if you want to camp up there, you have to enter the lottery. Oh and wow! You pick your name out of a hat, and luckily, out of the three of us, I was the one that got the golden ticket, so they were able to go on my ticket. Um, yeah. So it's very popular. It's hard to get. Up. It's hard to be able to go in there and camp in there. Yeah. People do go in there just for the day hikes, but it's a hell of a long way to go up for a day hike. Any cars on a day hike? So that's a yeah, you're looking at, I think it's about 30 or so kilometers return with 1,500 wow. meters. So that's a brutal hike. 
Yeah. And it often gets hot in this as well. But there isn't any one memory that stands out from there other than it was quite funny, actually, there's because there's quite a few mountain goats up there. And you have to be careful because they like to, if you leave your boots out, they like the salt. Uh, so yeah. they'll start yeah. eating your boots. Or if you pee on a rock, they'll start licking the rock because they that, like yeah. the saltiness. <laughs> but for whatever reason, this one mountain goat ha- had this just wouldn't leave me alone and it just it, <laughs> i don't know if she took a fancy to me or she i was running around and she was following me around and i climbed up on this rock and she climbed up on the rock and of course david cobb and sean are just howling with laughter because this <laughs> blasted goat wouldn't be leave me alone i don't know maybe she was lonely i don't, <laughs> I don't know but anyway that was one memory that stuck out that was quite funny other ones mostly to do with wildlife bears because we have a lot of bears on the coast here and also on the interior yep and there's been a few times when we've had meetings with bears that weren't really welcome they weren't aggressive or anything but you start to get really nervous when bears are hanging around yeah you know. yeah i remember that's one of the things when camping i've seen a few of your videos where you're doing overnight stays what precautions are you taking? You've obviously got bear spray, maybe an air horn or something like that. But obviously you've got to keep your food out of the, away from the ground and away from the tent and everything. That That's the biggest one is I don't worry about animals too much, but that one you should definitely, if you have food or toothpaste or anything like that, you just don't bring it into your tent. And yeah. obviously if you have your vehicle, just lock it in your vehicle. Or if you're out in the woods, usually... Most of the campsites in the backcountry, if you're staying in a campsite in the backcountry, they'll have places where you can put your food, like either a metal container or they'll have wires up in trees that you can hang your food. Yeah. And if not, then some places you have to go in there with, I think in the Cascades, actually, you have to bring a bear-proof container, which okay. is a huge pain in the butt, but it's basically just a big tub and it yep. screws together and you just put your food in there and then screw it back and yeah. put it bears can't get into it nice but i've never really had any any encounters that were really scary i think the animals that you should be probably more wary of especially on the island here are the cougars we have yeah. cougars over here but in, in 20 odd years of photographing over here i've never actually seen a cougar but that's the problem with them because they're big cats. They're predators. Yeah, so they're an ambush predator mostly. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're watching you. They'll see you before you see them. Yeah. Whereas bears aren't predators. They're, they'll just eat anything. And yeah. most of the stuff they eat is vegetation. Or you'll often see them on the coast when the tide's low. They go out and eat all the little crabs. Okay, yeah. But, but they, just, they just ignore you. They're just doing their thing. Yeah, yeah. You just the last you not interested in, in interacting with humans at all. No, nah, funny actually, because someone brought up this question the other day, and I said, to be honest with you, I'm more worried about the yahoos in the woods, like the rednecks with their guns and the. <laughs> uh, seriously, you'll get people go in the backwoods, and for whatever reason, they decide to get drunk and they start doing stupid things. Yeah. They're the ones you got to watch out for, not the bears. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> have you had any horror stories not necessarily with rednecks or no i haven't i've had words with a few people but uh, never came to fists or anything <laughs> <laughs> fair enough i want to move on to the how of your photography a little bit and how much planning you put into not necessarily a trip like say drakensberg or namibia obviously there's a lot of logistics in getting you and your gear and everything there but just one of your outings to do a vlog, for example. How much effort in, in, in planning are you doing before you head out? Or is it just, oh, the weather looks good, off I go? Pretty much. <laughs> I'm terrible when it comes to planning anything. It's amazing I get up in the morning. I just, <laughs> no, to be honest with you, I, some of it's laziness. But for the most part, I don't plan anything because one of the reasons is that if you start planning things, then you have expectations, right? Yeah. And as soon as you have expectations, then that becomes a problem because most, as they never work out. The they, weather or something doesn't cooperate. Yeah. Right? It'd be like me saying, I'm going on the West Coast and we're going to get amazing light and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it just doesn't happen. I, 
especially on the island here, because we do get a lot of rain. So I just tend to just go out and if the weather's miserable, then I'll try and pick something that will go with that weather. Yeah. And, you know, that, the thing about the island here, most of the subjects tend to be the trees or waterfalls, a little bit of coastline, and sometimes the mountains, but mostly waterfalls and trees. And as people say to me, how can you photograph waterfalls and trees all the time? Why don't you photograph anything? Is because that's what we have. <laughs> 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 There's lots that's of it about. We have. <laughs> we have a lot of trees and waterfalls. That's what I photograph. The coastline, we have a very wild coastline, mm-hmm. but it's not that dramatic. It's not photographically it's not like going down to the oregon coast or or the washington coast which is quite dramatic with sea stacks and we get storms coming through big waves but there's no rugged coastline or anything like that it's just mostly trees and then rocks and the ocean and that's that's pretty much so no i don't i'm sorry to say i don't do an awful lot of planning yeah fair enough (laughs) what about the process Obviously, it must take a bit of effort doing B-roll and that sort of thing for the video. You, are you walking backwards and forwards a couple of times to plant gear, pick up gear and move around? Yeah. You probably do most of your hikes that are maybe a 4K hike. You're probably doing 20Ks. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was saying earlier. Like, Because sometimes when I first started, you're putting all this effort in, Mm. but then all of a sudden when it came to the photography might not be that great. So you just put all this effort in and the photography is not awesome. So now I do things backwards. I'll go out, take the photographs first. And if I think they're half decent, then I'll vlog about it. Yeah, And and then I will do B-roll as I walk back to the van or wherever. Yeah, Uh, Not always, but it just... Because that way, at least you're doing all this video for a reason and not something that might happen. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you like Tom, like I said, he obviously thinks about a subject that he's going to photograph or he's he's going to talk about, and then he'll film it. And if he does get a decent shot, great. If he doesn't, then that's just part of the story. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think also people do like to see your failures. I mean, they probably learn more from your failures than your successes and not every video is going to be awesome and not yeah. every image is going to be awesome i'll often get people say to me oh your photography's really gone downhill for the last <laughs> couple of years you can't go out every time and get awesome shots like you very rarely get that's really it great yeah. Shot, you know? yeah. the only way you I, can think, get great shots, but... I think part of that is also you become very aware of your own I don't want to say limitations, but your own style and how you want an image to look. And you become very much more self-critical about your images as you progress. And that means that you're taking fewer and fewer images that you're happy with. No, no, I agree. And you do get very picky and and people will say, how come you didn't take a photograph of that scene behind you in the video? That was amazing. Well, it doesn't look the same <laughs> in the video as it does when you're standing there. It has to, and it has to motivate you. Yeah. It, yeah. it might be a wonderful scene to them, but to me, I might not. It's nice. It's not where your head's at the time. Yeah. Just like seeing a wonderful uh, sunset. Not every wonderful sunset is worth photographing, but it's still beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So why not just enjoy it and put your camera away and enjoy it? Definitely. <laughs> so are you straight into processing and doing post-production as soon as you get home or are you one to sit on your images for a little bit? No, and, I... And the um, video, I guess the video, you probably want to get that, get into that almost straight away. Sometimes. The processing, though, the images, I'm always pretty excited to, to get them on the computer and I usually work on them straight away. Yeah, it's I, it's quite funny though because running workshops and that a lot of people will say to you, "Oh man, I've still got images that I took two or three years ago that I haven't processed yet." I'm like, "What? I do it." As What's soon wrong as I get with you? <laughs> yeah, as soon as I get home, I can't wait, and I'll look yeah. at them and pick out the best ones. And some of that is because I want to put a video together, so I need them for the video. Sure, but most of it is because I'm really excited to see what I can do with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I don't think. <clears throat> I have images, older images that I didn't think were that great, that sometimes I'll go back to and look at them and think, oh, that's probably maybe it's not as bad as I thought and work on those. But most of the time I, I do it straight away. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Well, you mentioned doing fairly 
basic edits around contrast and dodging and burning. What's the most extreme you've got? I think that is the most extreme. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm a bit more heavy-handed with it than other times. Yeah. There was a stage there for a while there where I was really darkening everything, like making it really dark and then lightening up the highlights, which is actually not a bad way to process things. Yeah. So often when you get your photographs on the computer, especially if you're exposing everything to the right, they'll look quite bright and all the shadows will be open and... So sometimes it's nice just to darken the whole thing and then bring up the highlights to add that contrast and the mood. But for a while there, I was putting heavy vignettes around the whole image and yeah. brightening up highlights on the edges. And But I've really eased off since then. And I also used to use a lot of the Orton effect, especially in the background. And if I look at some of my older images, I just went way, way too much. It just doesn't, it looks too blurry. Yeah. So I've really eased off on that now. I use it very rarely. I, I think I'm trying to go more back to the basics than add yeah, more, more. More subtle stuff. editing. Than... I think part of the problem is that I forget. I You learn a new technique, but I forget how to do it unless you're doing it all the time. Yeah. So I tend to process images the same every time because that's what I know. And it works for me. I think sometimes my photographs look a bit flat and okay. often I'll go back and think, oh, I should have added a bit more contrast. So just boost up the contrast but that's just we're using a curve and just yeah it's not hard to do yeah yeah yeah. how long Um, would you spend on an image on average i'm guessing probably 10 15 minutes maybe okay yeah Yeah. some some obviously work a bit harder on if if you had a, a tricky situation where say you're shooting into the sun at sunrise and you want to bring details up in the foreground then Obviously, that's going to take a bit more work. Uh, but on average, if the light's flat and they're not very long at all. Yeah. How do you push past creative blocks? Everyone comes up against those times and feelings where you just go, I can't be bothered. How do you get around that? And do you have any strategy? Uh, usually, I take up some other, I'll just do something else. Yeah. I, it's funny, actually, because I, I go through these weird phases. I think one year I decided I was going to be a painter. So I started painting and I I just got right into painting. I'm not very good at it, but I got right into it. (laughs) And then this past year, because I was having a bit of a problem. We had such a hot, sunny summer that I was really unmotivated. So I started getting back into modeling. Like I was making like plastic models like you did when yeah, you the old kit. airfix kits yeah so i was watching all these youtube videos getting right into it so now i've got all these kits in my office here of these tanks and <laughs> <laughs> like amphibious stuff and i was getting right into it because you want all the you know you want to make them look like they're realistic and warm yeah, and get all the details and the oh yeah so i was getting right into that but yeah. it helped it, it really helps because it's a it's something that's has nothing to do with photography yeah and i'll do that for a while and then something just triggers in you, usually because I'm doing a workshop somewhere else, and then that motivates me. Yeah. So I've noticed in quite a few of your vlogs that you're photographing with other photographers. Do you enjoy that more than doing it on your own, or do you prefer to be out on your own? I think if I wanted to get things done, then you're better off on your own. But I find that when I'm with other photographers, I don't know, it's just a, it's just a good crack. We have a yeah, good laugh. Yeah. And especially if we were away for a few days, it's nice just to hang out with other people and have a beer or just yeah. chat, chat. It's hard to find people though that, because if I'm going to go with someone else, I don't want to be, I don't want to be with them all day i don't want them following me around and i'm sure they don't want me following them around so some of the friends that i've had generally we just do our own thing like my friend brian he'll come over to the island every now and then and he's pretty good because he'll just go and because he has a youtube channel as well so he just goes and does his own thing same with paul paul lives in the uk i've had some people get in touch with me obviously that want to hang out but I'm a little bit apprehensive because I don't want it to turn into them following me around, yeah, yeah. trying to get something out of it or information out of it. Yeah. And I know so, what you mean. <laughs> yeah. 
there there is a guy that that lives in Victoria that contacted me the other day. So I might meet up with him and I don't know. It's I like it. I like hanging out with other people. My friend Colin. He's a friend. He was a friend of Gavin's at first. And when Gavin left, I just kept hanging out with Colin. But he's good to have along because he just does yeah. his own thing. Cool. What do you see as the future of landscape photography? And I guess what challenges do you see in that future? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I th- It's because... I, I, It's an exciting time to be a photographer right now, like with all the technology. Yeah. The cameras are incredible. The lenses are incredible. Yeah, even drone. in the phone space, the way that's moved is just insane. Yeah, I just got a new iPhone and the camera is just amazing. The video yeah. is incredible. I was watching a video about the new Inspire 3, the DJI drone, the Inspire 3. What an incredible piece of equipment. But when it comes to computers and ai and and that side of thing and nfts that's not my shtick i don't get it i just don't get it some people there's these there's quite a bit of a community around ai and nfts and all that stuff i the thing is i'm an i'm a nature photographer i'm not just a photographer i'm a nature photographer yeah I come at it a, a bit differently because it's actually the subject matter that I care about more than the photography. Yep. Whereas some people, they're, they're photographers, they just like the photography. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. It'll be interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's strange to me that film is, has made such a big comeback. I shot a lot of film and I, I I I don't and there's no way in hell I want to shoot film again. I just yeah, I'm the same. I, I lived through that in the 70s and 80s. I don't really but, want to go but having said that, I do get it, especially print film. If you're printing your own stuff, then absolutely, I, yeah. I can see value in that. But I saw I shot slide film, so I look at my old slides now, and I said, man, why would I go back to that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I have I have three filing cabinets full of old slides i haven't looked yeah. at them in about 10 years <laughs> i scanned the best ones and then that was it yeah fair enough fair enough i don't know where do you think it'll go i guess i'm i think i can see for commercial photography the ai being a bit of a threat to product and even the modeling industry because you can basically get an ai image to do very much what you want for a campaign. I can also see, I've spoken about this a couple of times on the podcast before, I can see where that will actually, the advertising side of things and the way that industry works is that will probably start to leverage AI to even change the images that you're seeing in campaigns during the campaign automatically based on the audience reactions. So yeah. I can see that going down that path quite rapidly because they're all about making it cheaper, making it as impactful as possible. So those gaudy images tend to be what they're after. Yeah. In terms of landscape, I don't think people will stop wanting to do what you and I love, which is getting out into nature and recording it. I don't think that'll ever stop. The technology will get better, obviously. It might get easier in, in some ways. I know that you just talked about the hassles of film. The one, one of the things I used to hate was the smell of the dark room. That just the chemicals involved in it were pretty horrible. <laughs> and yeah. so digital, uh, that's one of the reasons why digital's my, my favourite way of operating. But I think that ease of use and accessibility of the the camera interfaces and those sorts of things will probably just make recording the images better. Greater, We're already seeing dynamic range that's approaching. It's still not there yet, but it's approaching the human eye. And I think that'll eventually turn up. And so you will literally be able to push a button and not have to worry about filters and all the rest of those sorts of things. Yeah, apart from wanting to do maybe long exposure, creative stuff with them. Yeah, yeah. No, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But I think you're right. I think when it comes to nature photography, I think there'll always be 
some kind of desire for it because it it really is for a lot of people just a good excuse to get outside absolutely yeah. i think for me when i first started and i've done other activities as well that i enjoy doing outside but really the activity is secondary to really just being out there really absolutely it's just a good, yeah. it's just a good excuse really isn't yeah. it <laughs> What else are you going to do if you're outside? You might as well take photo of us. That's exactly it. Even if it is only on a phone. Then. Yeah. Yeah, my last couple of videos, actually, a lot of it was with was from the phone. My Karen, she just used her phone. And actually, it wasn't even at 4K. We had it set up wrong. It was just a HD 1080p. Yeah. You can notice it, but most people don't notice that. Well, when they're streaming, it's sometimes that their internet connection is going to throttle it back anyway, so... Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. I guess part of the adjunct to that question around the future of photography is the future of social media and how that's changed. What are your opinions on things like Twitter and Meta, which is your Facebook and Instagram, charging for the blue tick and therefore tamping down engagement or tamping down distribution oh, of the people that haven't paid to paid to play? Okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be really honest with you right now, and yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> won't be popular. I actually really hate social media. I hate all aspects of social media. I think the whole thing is totally useless. And that's saying someone from YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. I think the problem a lot of people have, and I have this, is that they get sidetracked. I think the intention was good with those social media sites, but yeah. you get so sidetracked and so many people get sidetracked by useless information or whatever it may be, conspiracy theories or whatever, that they lose sight of why they're on there in the first place. And I think it's a huge distraction for a lot of people. Definitely. And I, I, I am on social media. I post stuff on Instagram and usually I'll post a, an image or two a week. I have a Twitter account that I use now and then, but I just find that I get so distracted by all the other stuff that's on there that I'm not interested in that. Sure. I, I think, well, why am I even looking at this stuff? It's just taking my day up. The uh, the blue tick and all that, I don't know. I don't get it. I have a good, here's a good example for you. So, okay, so Flickr, which has been around for a long time. Sure. Yep. And actually, I post images on Flickr every now and then because at least you can put something that's a bit higher quality than some of the other places. Yeah. Twitter's not bad for photographs. Instagram is terrible. Vero, which is another site that I've been on, which is actually a pretty good site when it comes to social media. But Flickr, I have one image on there that has 30 million views. Wow. That's a lot of views. 30 million views. Yeah. And what has it brought to me? Nothing. Like, Okay, so 30 million people have looked at my image. So what? And it, and that's how I feel with a lot of the other social media sites. People are so hung up on views and likes, and but so what? That's right. It doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> now, I can see if you're a business and you're trying to make a presence and you want people to know about your products and that. I get that. Yep. But as a photographer, maybe I'm missing the boat here, but... I know a lot of my friends and other photographers have accounts on Instagram. They're constantly on Instagram and constantly posting stuff. But I don't get what the, I don't know. What, maybe I'm missing something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just don't get it. Maybe it's yeah. an age thing. Yeah, I'm kind of with you in a lot of ways. I get, as you say, if you're trying to make money out of your photography and you want your presence, you need to have that. Sure social media otherwise how else are people going to find you because otherwise what are you where are you going to advertise but yeah i guess a lot of people don't look at websites anymore yeah it's, i guess it's kind of a calling card or here's my instagram account or whatever yeah. Yeah. i don't know I've, it must be an age thing it has to be <laughs> same thing like like tiktok i just i don't get that at all i yeah i'm with you there that's not where i'm focusing any of my energies <laughs> the weird thing is that Think TikTok. Now I could be wrong here, but supposedly in China, TikTok is used for educational purposes. So a lot of people will yeah. have little videos on there where they'll actually you'll actually learn something, mm. or there might be some useful information on there. Whereas TikTok in North America, anyway, is just 
a bunch of usually young women or men just showing off a lot of skin and dancing around and doing stupid stuff. I, Basically, yeah. I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. That, that and very short cat videos. <laughs> uh, no, I don't pick on the cat videos. I like the cat videos. <laughs> I've got to admit, I use YouTube as a university if I want to know how to do something. For sure, for sure. You know, it's great for that sort of thing. But yeah. yeah. Would I watch my own videos? Probably not. <laughs> it's all right. I don't listen to my own podcast. <laughs> I just can't stand myself talking all the time. I'm the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dear. What's your favourite thing know. about being a photographer? More, more to do with working for myself. I've never really worked for another company or anything. So I guess the one thing that I really do cherish is my time. And I've always, I'm a bit odd this way. I've always tried to spend as much time doing the things that I really love doing and finding a way to do them rather than just working my ass off for retirement. Yeah. I know that I've been really lucky. Things have gone my way pretty good. But I, I when it comes to photography, <clears throat> I definitely think I could probably make quite a bit more money than I am. But to be honest with you, I'd much rather just make enough money to to, to earn a living. But yeah. I cherish the time off that I have more so I can do th the fun stuff, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've met so many people that they work really hard all their lives and they work long hours and they make good money. But by the time they're retired, either their health is really poor or they have all these health issues or they yeah. can't do the things that they want to do. Yeah, miss, they've missed out on the, that opportunity to actually... Yeah, it's a fine line. It's a fine line because well, especially in North America, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but here most people only get, I think, two weeks off a year for holidays. Yeah, we get four. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Most people here, they just work, work, work all the time and they, they make good money, but they don't have any time to do any other stuff. And then you'll have people like me that have tons of time, or I used to be, have tons of time, but wouldn't have any money to do anything. So it's kind of like a <laughs> yeah. fine line between the two. Of them. If you can find a balance in, you're, you're doing great. Absolutely. Um, so that's where I try to balance is, is try to make half decent money but at the same time have a lot of time to do the things that i really enjoy doing which is most of the time is just going outside with my camera because I, I enjoy that yeah so what's your least favorite thing about being a photographer dealing with people <laughs> <laughs> it's funny i because it's only been the last few years where i've been doing talks and and workshops and stuff like that. And it's funny because at the time I enjoy doing them, but yeah. it's the build up before them that I think, oh man, I, I, like I just feel like I don't want to do it. But when yeah. I do it, I actually enjoy it. If yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but the other day I did a talk and I think, oh God, now I've got to do a damn talk. And, oh, and but then when I did it, I really enjoyed it. So yeah. it's stupid, but yeah. Yeah. The anticipation is sometimes the worst part of anything. Sometimes it can be good, but sometimes it could be, yeah. Uh... Yeah, and it's the same with the workshops. I do enjoy doing them, but I think sometimes it's a bit of anxiety because you, sometimes you might get someone on there that you really don't want to be with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've paid to spend some time with you. So. <laughs> Precisely. But I haven't had too many of those. Most people, are, they're on holiday, so they're in a great mood and they just like being there. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. yeah. Are there any photographers that you think I should be talking to? Oh, I think now. Who haven't you talked to? <laughs> I don't know. I've still got a, a very big list of people that I haven't spoken to. But Have you talked to Joe Cornish? No, he's on my list. Uh, I haven't reached out to him yet, but I definitely want to get hold of him. Simon Baxter, maybe? He's um, another one on the list, but I haven't got to. Yeah. So you've picked some good ones there. Thank you. William Neal is a really nice fellow. He's been around for forever. <clears throat> my friend Alistair, he's always good to talk to. Alistair Ben. I've had him on, yeah. Yep. Oh, have you? Yep. Who else? 
I'm trying to think of some English photographers. I don't know that many Australian photographers, unfortunately. That's fine. I'm getting through them. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> a Canadian, let's see, a Canadian photographers. Victoria Hack. She's had her on, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, I wonder if my, my friend Brian, I mean, he's not okay. he's not very he's not that known, but he's he's a really good street photographer. He yeah, I've seen, seen a bit of his work and seen, um, seen him I, I don't know if he'd go on your podcast or not. I'm not sure. Oh, he's, yeah. But, yeah, I'll ask. Should, yeah, I think you'd be chuffed if you did ask him. All right. He might be a bit hard to understand, but because he's from Carlisle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Who else? There's a lot of American photographers that you've probably perhaps talked to already. Like yeah, I've already had Sean Bagshaw. and Michael, Sean Bagshaw and Michael Shane Bloom. I haven't yeah. had Nick Page yet, but again... Nick's, Nick's, Nick's a good guy. On. Nick's a good guy. Yeah. Have you had Gavin on? No, not yet. I haven't reached out to him. He's, again, on, on the list. <laughs> He'll probably want money off you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send him chocolate. He's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be flogging his book. <laughs> what's it called something about ore or something <laughs> actually who oh, else is a really good photographer the image that you have behind you there is that frankie frankie Gabler? frankie gabler yeah have you had her on i have had her on yeah oh you have yep <laughs> that, that that's actually the book of the i did a landscape photography world awards last year and oh. she actually won that and that's the winning image on the cover. I know become that was my favorite image. It's just amazing. Yeah. I actually as I was talking to you, I kept looking at it. I thought I that's I know that photograph. <laughs> that was definitely my favorite photograph. She's a really good photographer. Oh absolutely fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed having a chat with her. Thank you for that. I've got one more question for you and for okay. Most of my listeners, it's the most important one I can ask a landscape photographer because it's a challenging one that we've got to get to the bottom of. Do you like pineapple on pizza? You mean Hawaiian? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind it. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot of people that are against it. There's a lot of people that are... You have to have ham with it, though. You oh, definitely, yeah. Pineapple. It's got to have it has... the salt versus the sweet. Yeah, yeah. And usually there's lots of cheese with it as well, so it's that salty, sweetie thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't I like mind that. it. It's not my favourite, but I don't mind it. Yeah, so you wouldn't order it, but you'll eat it if it's there. Uh, no, nah, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably order something else before. Mediterranean before that. Oh, Karen's correct. vegetarian, so I can't. I wouldn't be ordering anything with ham on it. So no. <laughs> I have a question for you. Do you like anchovies on pizza? I haven't picked them off for a long time. I used to when I was a kid, but yeah, they're okay. It's, I like, I love anchovies. Yeah, it depends on what else is on the pizza. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, thank you. Do you like sushi? Oh, I love sushi. Yeah. Oh yeah, we love sushi as well. We have sushi at least once a week. <laughs> oh, same. Yeah. There's a reasonably good place up the road here that we frequent that usually does a pretty good job. Yeah. Same here. We have a place about a block away, so very handy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ha handy to have those places hanging around. Yeah, right next to the liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks for taking the time out to talk to me today, Adam. It's been wonderful spending a, a bit of time getting to know you. Oh, where thanks can people for find me. your work? Oh, where can they find it? Yeah. AdamGibbs.com. It's all about Thank me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just AdamGibbs.com or YouTube, obviously, is Adam Gibbs Photography. And then Instagram is A Gibbs Photo, I think. I'm pretty sure yeah. if people put in Adam Gibbs on Instagram, they'll probably find you. Yeah, you're probably either that or there'll be there's a voice actor for anime named oh, okay. Adam Gibbs, and there's a model or an actor model guy from the UK named Adam Gibbs as well. Fair enough. Well, I got a brother-in-law. His name's Tony Donovan, and apparently he's he delights in pointing people to a porn star whose name is the same, a gay porn star <laughs> whose name is the same as his. That's great. <laughs> Well, thank, thanks very much, mate. It's been wonderful having a chat. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Cheers. 
All right. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show. Keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. If you're interested in buying prints or photography gear or doing a photo workshop with me, these are now on sale on my website. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.